Good morning again, church. Welcome to Waterway. We are an evangelical Mennonite congregation. Our goal is we want to see everyone be, yeah, start over. It's right there on the wall. I don't know what's so hard. (laughs) We want to see everyone we know become more like Jesus. That's our main focus in how we do worship here and how we live our life throughout the week. So we're glad you're here. If you have any questions when you leave, uh, I think I saw Anthony out at the connection table. Um, See the table straight out from the doors if you have questions about anything, and we'll try to answer them for you. We are glad you're here. Let's worship God together. Uh, Let's dig right into the scripture this morning. I'm looking at Psalm 119 for a call to worship devotional passage. Uh, We're not going to read the whole psalm. There's a pile of verses in in Psalm 119, but we'll start at the beginning in verse 1 to verse 8. He says in verse 1, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart. As I learn your righteous laws, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. I want to look back at verse 2. Um, I'll read that again. It says, Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. If you're like me, the, the first part we're fairly good at, at keeping his statutes, the laws of the Lord. Um, I think we do a fairly good job at, at doing what we're supposed to do as Christians. Um, it's the second part that I struggle with, and, and I believe that's, that's the far more important part in looking at the whole of Scripture. Um, it says, seek him with all your heart. And I wonder, I wonder if we're good at that. Um, the first part's easily attainable. You, you can kind of check it off, you know, um, honor your father and mother, do not kill, do not steal, all the Ten Commandments and all the, the commands in the Scripture. We can, we can kind of see if we're doing okay, if our kids are doing okay. We can see if other people's kids aren't doing okay. Um, but it's the second part. It's, it's not quite as measurable. It's more in the realm of the unknown and, and seeking God. Um, and so it's harder to, 
to see where our hearts are at. Um, but as I said, I think that's far more important um, to Christ as, as we look in his ministry and um, in the whole of the scripture. And so I think it'd be fitting um, to seek God with all our hearts. Um, if we would do that in prayer as a church together, um, I would ask you, it's been a while since we've done this, but could you kneel with me in prayer in a posture of humility as, as we come to the Lord in prayer and seek him with our whole hearts? Um, if you're able, if you could kneel as we come to God in prayer. Father, we come before you today in this position of humility because you're worthy, Father. You, you made the heavens and the earth. You created us. Father, you sent your son Jesus to save us when we couldn't save ourselves. And Holy Spirit, you're here with us today, and, and we thank you for your, your power. We thank you for your love, and you are worthy. Father, we confess that sometimes we don't seek you with our whole hearts. I, I confess that I'm easily distracted or divided. And later in the Psalms, it says in Psalm 139 that, that God search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and, and know my, my wickedness and see if there be any wicked way in me and, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so I wonder, church, if, if we would take a minute together to ask God to search our hearts individually. Holy Spirit, come, lead us. Show us what, what we need to change. Show us how you want to make us different. Father, we ask for forgiveness for when, when we've placed things that, that are of no, earth, no eternal importance in the same realm as your name and your kingdom. Father, forgive us for being divided. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Show us how to seek you with our whole hearts. Sometimes we can't even muster up the courage and, and strength to do that ourselves. So Holy Spirit, help us to seek you first in your kingdom. God, we want to do that as individuals, we want to do that together today. So, Father, we, we want to seek you in our marriages today, today. Father, as husbands, help us to love well and lead well. Help the wives to respect well. And help that, that relationship that, that was probably brought together in, in many differences. Help those differences not to divide us, but to bring us together and so that the world can see a beautiful relationship together as husband and wife that reflects you and your church. Father, we pray for, that we would seek you in our, in our families. We pray that our children would, would see us as parents and grandparents seeking you daily, that they would see us on our knees before you, Father, so that they could, in, in turn, in the next generation, seek you with their whole hearts as well. God, we pray for our friends and relationships, that we would seek you in, in those relationships at work, at school, in, in the community around us, Father, as, as we interact with non-believers especially, I pray that, that our seeking you would rub off on them, that they could see the beauty of you as they interact with us. Father, give us the courage to share your name and not be ashamed of the name of Jesus as we talk to those who don't believe. And help us to see your, the fruits of, of a relationship with you as, as they can see you and come to know you as well. Holy Spirit, change the lives around us and help us to be part of that. And God, we need you in our church today. We need you in just as we work together, as we interact with each other. Father, we're all called to the same purpose. But God, it's hard to work together sometimes. Give us unity. Father, I think of the, the nomination slate that's out, that the people that, are, that we're asking to take on roles in the church to make your church go forward, I pray that you would bring the right people to each, to each spot. 
God, I specifically think of the Christian Ed chair. I know it's a big calling, but God, you have people here that are gifted in those ways, and I pray that you would bring the right person forward. And God, we seek you for our government today. You ask us to pray for our authorities, and I admit that it, it's hard to do sometimes. I, I fail at that. And God, forgive us for spending more time complaining about them than praying for them, God. We lift them up and we pray for wisdom in a job that seems impossible to do well. So we pray for your wisdom. We pray that your work would go forward through the authorities around us. And God, we seek you for the, those in our congregation, the, the list in the bulletin who are sick. We pray for the people who have, have been on that list and, and things haven't changed and they're still struggling with health challenges. We pray for those who, who haven't asked for help or haven't asked for prayer, but are struggling with, with challenges, with sins, with addictions. We pray that your Holy Spirit would, would change the course of our lives, that you would heal those who need healed in whatever way they need healing. Father, we thank you for heaven. We thank you for the healing that will take place there. And we long for the day to be there together. Father, remind us to, to be on our knees throughout the week, not to have this be a, an abnormal occasion, but to, to seek you with our whole hearts, Father. Thank you for, for your forgiveness. Thank you for calling us back to you. Father, we want to see you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take a minute to... Uh, it's been a long time since we've passed the plate. Many, some of you probably don't even remember us passing the plate for the offering here. And it, it seems like it gets overlooked sometimes, um, the offering portion. But there is an offering box in the back, and you can give online. Um, we'll be hearing a little bit from MCC later on. Um, they're one of our monthly partners. Uh, this month is Gateway Medical Alliance. Um, if you're not familiar with what the, meta, or with what the monthly mission partner is, we kind of call it a different thing all the time. But um, so we, we have a calendar of different ministries. Some are local, some are abroad. Um, but we give, so, so the giving that comes in, 25% goes out in missions. Um, so when you give to the offering, uh, a good portion of it's going back. So, so each month we have uh, a mission or two that we give to. It's between nine and 10,000 that goes out each month to support God's work throughout the world. Um, and along with Gateway Medical Alliance, um, George and Mardell uh, Landis are serving um, through, through Gateway. Um, they, get, they get a lot of their medical supplies through them. So I want to take a minute to pray for those missions and our offering as well. <clears throat> Father, you've blessed us. <laughs> God, you've blessed us immensely. Help us not to take it for granted. Forgive us for thinking that it's ours to, to uh, decide what we do with. God, we want to give back to you um, through our offering, through our lives. And so we think of these missions that we, su that we support. Um, we thank you for the work here in Oxford that's being done through this church. We, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to, to guide us in, in how to spend our money well and how to, to use all our resources well. Father, we think of Gateway Medical Alliance, especially George and Mardell. We pray that you would lead them today, that you would protect them that they could see the fruits of your labor, of their labor. Father, that you would change that culture around them, um, that the people where they are living could see the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Father, encourage them. I pray for their, their, their boys in school, that you would keep them, protect them, help them to choose you as, as they go out and as they learn and, and are ready to, to begin on their own, that, that they would continue the legacy that their parents have started. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we continue in worship and as we sing, I lift my eyes up.
Father, you are the source of our love. Jesus, you are the source of our joy. Spirit, you are the source of our peace.
You may be seated. See, that's a nasty trick that the worship team... Uh, thanks, Reuben, I could use that. It's a nasty tri trick that the worship team did there. They left that song kind of hanging without resolution. And they told me this morning that they were going to do that. And so now it's up to me to resolve it. And here's, here's how we resolve just kind of that, that musical hang. We continue to say in our hearts, great are you, Lord. Just over and over, great are you, Lord. When things don't make sense, we remember what we know. Great are you, Lord. When we're confused and when we hurt, we remember what we know. Great are you, Lord. When things around the world seem to be falling apart, what do we say? Great are you, Lord. Right? So there's the, the, that's the thing about this life is that things don't always resolve, do they? Things don't always come up in a tidy bow just because we sang a song or because we prayed a prayer. But we continue to come back and we say, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Um, so I'd like to... Uh, in, in kind of that continuing spirit, I'd like to dismiss the kids under this banner of greater you, Lord, because we want our kids to learn more and more about who the Lord is and learn more and more about how to serve him. So kids who are going to children's church and kids who are going to Waterway 2-5. So children's church is for kids from four years old to first grade. Waterway 2-5 is for kids from second grade to fifth grade. I'd like all of you to, to join me down here for just a minute. All right, lots of you today. Good, good, good. I am glad to see you. I have a challenge for you. I have a challenge for you. Now, we just... Right, and you got a challenge for me. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Did you know that if you're the tallest, everybody can see which way you're looking? I don't think everybody knows that, do they? Well, hey, I'm glad you guys are here today. We just finished singing a song, and, and what were the words that I said over and over just right now? Do you remember? Great are you, Great are you Lord. That's exactly right. That's exactly it. Great are you, Lord. And I heard the adults singing it. I heard lots of bass. I didn't hear too many kids. I would love to hear you. Just before you go to Children's Church, could you give me a Great are you, Lord? One, two, three. Great are you, Lord. No, that, that was not good enough at all. I need it. I need it to feel more like, huh, more like that, okay? One, two, three. Ah, oh, that's what I like to hear. Let, let's pray together. Let's pray together, guys. Lord, you are great. Great are you, Lord. Thank you, God, for this chance to be here together today. I thank you for these boys and girls. I thank you for the, uh, for the people that have put in time to organize Waterway 2-5 and Children's Church. And Lord, now as they go, I pray that they will be filled to their deepest part of their bones with the reality that, Lord, you are great. Lord, we love you. All you kids, can you say amen? Amen. 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 All right. So why don't you head out there? We've got, oh, there's Pastor Steve, and I see a Kareen out there. All kinds of people excited to see you. Go. You can even hold hands. See ya. Have fun. All right. <laughs> oh, my. Even in our weakness, the Lord is great. Can I get an amen from all you Mennonites in the room? All right. All right. Um, right now, right now, we're going to take a moment to think about missions. And I'm going to invite Carol Zook to come forward and join me here on the stage. Carol is the director of the Mennonite Central Committee, uh, um, uh, the, the Relief Center in Ephrata. And so, uh, sorry, and make sure we get all the titles correct. So, so come on over and join me. And um, Carol, I've got a seat for you right here. And so we were talking this week about how this could go. I said, I said, well, you know, she could come and, and speak at the pulpit and just give you a couple minutes about what's going on. Or I said, I could interview you and, and ask you a couple questions and some leading questions. She said, let's do that. And so, um, so that's what we're going to do. But I do want to give congregation, I want to give you a little bit of background before, because Carol, I don't believe that you have spoken to us before here in this building. And um, so this is maybe a little bit of inside baseball. I hope you don't mind. Um, but as Carol and I were talking this week, uh, I became aware, Carol, you have a, a grandson who's 15 months old, who is at Hershey Medical Center right now. And the last email that you sent me, you were sitting with your grandson who has just had a bone marrow transplant. 15 months old at Hershey Medical Center, um, and your, your kids, his parents are going through quarantining and health stuff, and, and so Carol is being really careful, even though she's here today in this great cloud of witnesses and all of our germs, 
She's being uh, really careful because she is going back today to help watch over that young one. So she is not going to greet all of you in the lobby today after the service, but she's here with us now. And before I ask you any more questions, we're going to pray for you. you. Would that be all right? Are there any, now that I've opened that whole emotional can of worms, am I going to be able to talk? Are there, are there any specific prayer requests for you or your family that we can talk about before we talk about big mission stuff? Um, Just strength for my husband and I and our children and Ezra. Ezra is at this. All right. So we'll, we'll pray for Ezra, um, who's that been, bone marrow transplant works. that the bone marrow transplant works. He's been through chemotherapy and all kinds of stuff. And um, so we'll pray for Ezra and Ezra's parents and for you and your husband, his grandparents. Church, can we pray together? Lord, um, Lord, we lift up Ezra and now Carol and the whole family. Lord, we pray together that this bone marrow transplant would work. You know, every detail about his body, about what he needs. You know every minute of his life what it has been and what it's going to be. But Lord, from our perspective, it just seems like it would be so good that he would be healed. And so we ask for his healing. And I ask for strength for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa as they watch and wait alongside him to see what you're going to do. Lord, we love you and trust you, and thank you for this time that we can pray together today. Amen. Now, I didn't tell Carol that I was going to pray for her that way, so I hope that's an okay curveball and not a terrible curveball. That's fine. But I think it is on, and just speak into it. And we've got, we've got uh, the vocal mic there. And so just a, a super quick bit of background. Carol has lots of experience working around the world. You've been in Bangladesh. Uh, you and your husband have been in Haiti, and you served in Calcutta in India. And so you've seen some poor spots. And now you are at the uh, Mennonite Resource Center in Ephrata. You've been there for four years as a director. And uh, in fact, we have a group. There's still plenty of openings with that group to go up this Thursday. It's in your bulletin. It's in your bulletin. So check it out if you'd like to go and, and help with some material aid stuff. But uh, Carol, talk to us. What do you do? Why do you do it? Who cares? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let me just say that I am from Willow Street, that my family name is Lemon. Uh, Lemon? And lemon? Uh, 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 <laughs> lemon is how you said it growing up? It is. Spelled L-E-H-M-A. L-E-A. L-E-A. Well, this is like some yeah. deep Mennonite <laughs> family, uh, family stuff. So my family is all very supportive of us as well. Good. Just to say, over this, over this period of, of time and before. We will pray um, for the Lemon family. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yes. My husband and I, um, so I went to Lampeter Strasburg, didn't take a language at all. And then when I, we were 24, uh, we moved to Bangladesh. And it was just as well. I didn't learn German or French because it didn't help. Because <laughs> nobody in Bangladesh knows <laughs> German or French <laughs> no, either, right? No. So, okay. Anyway, um, um, but yes, why does it matter what we do at the Material Resources Center? And why does it matter what MCC does? MCC is a very small organization, but it is a constituency-based organization. Um, Let me just read the mission statement because I don't have it memorized and I should. MCC, a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist churches, shares God's love and compassion for all in the name of Christ by responding to basic human needs and working for peace and justice. MCC envisions communities worldwide in right relationship with God, one another, and creation. Mm -hmm. And would that it be so, right? Um, So what what we have done and what we do up at the Material Resources Center, and I am so privileged to work there because I get to see all the volunteers that come in and pour their hearts into volunteering, whether they are recycling, we recycle books, we recycle clothing. I know that some of you work at the uh, Reuse It shop in Willow Street. Main Street Closet? Yes, Mm -hmm. and every Tuesday we go down and pick up things, leftovers from them, and take them up and, and work at recycling that. That earns money for MCC, just as the Main Street Closet does. 
Um, internationally, I know that MCC works with agriculture and with education, and I'm just saying some of the things we worked with in Calcutta, and uh, we came home from Calcutta four years ago, and then I got this job. So it was amazing to be on that side to see the benefit of the the education, mm -hmm. you know, to see somebody be able to support their family after they received a vocational training, to, to see just the very practical things. MCC does not plant churches. We attended local churches, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And in India, there are many Mennonite churches. We worked through Mennonite churches. Um, they were planted by missionaries in the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so we worked through Mennonite churches. We also were able to work through other organizations, and um, we don't only help Christians, mm -hmm. it's whoever is in need. Mm -hmm. And so it was really good to be on that side, and it's really good to be on this side and see the volunteer's heart for, for God and the compassion that people have. So you're seeing at the Resource Center, you're seeing volunteers come together and help in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of projects and recycling and so forth so that, so that money can be raised that can go around the world, not just to feed people or to give clothing, but mm -hmm. to invest in people and train people and give them, uh, give them the kind of skills that can help them to sustainably that, that's one live of the through roles. life, right? So um, I was fortunate enough to go to Zambia and I came home from Zambia a couple of weeks ago. And okay. um, we went to a, we went to a um, refugee camp. And MCC helps at refugee camps. Here's people that have run from Congo or Angola or Rwanda, Rwanda and gotten down to Zambia. And they, I, I don't think they can do anything, right? They, they're just They're kind of stuck. Poor. They're stuck there, yeah. And so we send in relief kits and infant care kits and, and some of those things. And we got to see how they use the buckets and how they use the, ta you know, mm -hmm. and to see comforters hanging over the wash lines was just really, really a good thing. We could see that what people do for, you know, for people yeah. works. Um, or is a small drop in the bucket for them. Right. But, but we, our goal is to do it in the name of Christ and to let people know that other people are thinking of them. So if they come up, they may be asked to uh, put school kits together. We do quality control kind of things. Likely working in the sewing room, you don't need to know how to sew. You can go in the sewing room and do it just a variety of things, not comforters or um, even that has a needle. If you're scared of that, you can still come. Um, so there's jobs so there's for people. Many, even, many things to Even do. for the very simple yes. among us yes. who don't have yes. great yes. skills, you will, you will show us things to do so that it's a worthwhile day yes. to be able to get some things um, done. The one thing that needs to be done right now, I think they'll prob probably have them do, is check meat. And this is a very boring job because you're just checking the top and the bottom of every can of meat. And they, we can it with a mobile cannery that goes mm -hmm. around, and there's one in Kirkwood um, that, that is, takes place once a year. But we check the meat so that we don't have the bump and dip, not BBs, not, you know, we can't mm -hmm. do that there. Because right. if somebody opens the, up the container and smells bad meat, mm -hmm. the whole container, you know, that would, and hasn't happened that we know of. Sure. Uh, the, also, the USDA comes and checks m the meat, is, does random samples. So, so you we, need folks who can, who we this need, week, mm -hmm, check some cans, mm -hmm. make sure the dates are good. and Make sure that there's no, um, no bumps or dents, and then you put them back in, and then we seal them up properly, and then they go on their way. This and week, we sent four shipments to Ukraine. Four shipments, and, and each shipment, how much? Well, it's a tractor trailer load. A tractor trailer, so four shipments of canned meat to you, no, or uh, no, four five. shipments of stuff. Four shipments of stuff. I can just tell you what we have sent to Ukraine since okay. this past year. We sent 24,000 comforters. We sent 3,400 lightweight comforters, which just means that um, they might not have a middle to them. We prefer them with the middle. But anyway, we sent uh, 10,500 relief kits, 40,000 hygiene kits, 2,000 infant care kits, 1,500 sewing kits, 10,000 school kits, 550 dignity kits, and soap and bed sheets and some store-bought blankets. So mm -hmm. Ukraine, we have sent 12 shipments so far this year. 
we've sent to Malawi, Ethiopia. Ethiopia refugee camp gets a lot of meat. Mm. Um, and uh, Chad gets meat and Burundi gets school kids. So we, we, send, we send to our reps who have met with partners and are figuring out what people need. So a, a lot of you are not able to go to those places, right? And how many of you in the last year have prayed for Ukraine, for example, but thought, boy, I'd like to be able to do something more. I mean, prayer matters, and it matters huge, but you'd like to do something more? Well, here's an opportunity on Thursday. Go give a couple hours and help out with stuff that makes a difference around the world. Yeah. All right. That's basically, yeah. Well, you've still got a microphone for, for, yeah. for whatever you need to say. What do you need to tell us? Anything we missed? Um, yeah, I, I feel privileged to be able to work with MCC. Like you said, I've worked 16 years internationally and four years locally. And realize that MCC runs because of people like you. You say that you're on the, you give donations uh, to MCC, but it also runs because people come and volunteer and give the material relief um, that, that we need. We are constituency based and we want to remember that all types of Anabaptists g um, give us things and we are very, very, and support us. That's our goal. We started out 100 years ago with that as a, as a plan. Anabaptists divide. They do not come together very well. Mm -hmm. We know that, right? Right. Um, so, so that has been a blessing for us in that we have the support of many, many different kinds of Anabaptists. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing with us today. And, and uh, so thank you so much. Um, if, if you decide that you'd like to go up on Thursday from our congregation, who's leading that trip? Um, Susan is, is helping lead that trip. So on Thursday, there's stuff for all kinds of different ages. If you need details or want to know about it, talk to Susan today uh, before the service is over, or maybe get her phone number if you don't know Susan very well and don't have a minute today. If you have a good youth group, you could call and uh, come up on a Saturday or in an evening. I know it's a long ways from here. So even on weekends and evenings, there are opportunities if things are scheduled ahead of time. If things are scheduled ahead of time. All right. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank All right. All right. So, folks, please be praying for, um, for Carol, uh, for her family, um, for MCC, the Resource Center. And um, if you are not able to uh, go along with the group on Thursday, please, uh, please pray for those who are going, that they'd be able to have a meaningful time while they serve the Lord and, uh, and our brothers and sisters around the world. So, um, we're going to continue on today as we kind of dive into this sermon time. I, I, want to, I want to look at John chapter 6 today. And, and we're going to look at a big chunk of John chapter 6 quickly. And then a very sh small sliver of John chapter 6 in more detail. And I want to read for you. As you're kind of getting your Bibles and, and opening up to John 6, I want to read for you six of the verses. This is John 6, 35 to 40. I want to read these aloud so that these can be in the back of our minds with all the rest of the stuff that's happening. And so here is John 6, 35 to 40. It says that Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about worldview stuff here at Waterway Church, and I know that can be, um, that can be really big picture and really small picture, but the question I wanted to think about today with you guys is, how many of you have a deep sense of how things ought to be. There's just a way things ought to be. And that's, that's the way, if you're, if you're parking your car, there's a way you ought to do it. And, and how many of you have a spouse or a child or a parent who has a really strong sense of the way things ought to be? Don't raise your hand, especially if they're sitting beside you, right? But there's, that's just not how we do it, right? We do it like 
this. That's, that's a little bit of a worldview, right? Most of those things, they haven't even been things that we thought about. It's just things that we, that we really strongly prefer. It seems like it should be that way. This is how I'm going to do it. And we see everything through that lens. That's, that's a worldview. And the challenge the last couple of weeks is, is all the stuff in your life, all the things that you do, the things that you think about and the things that you act on, are they all really coming under the banner of Christ or is it just kind of what you do? Because what I want to suggest to you is if all of your stuff is just a strong sense of what you do, it's very easy to get out of alignment. It's very easy to have some things that are based on Jesus, but others that are based on grandpa and others that are based on that article I read years ago. And, and we can get into this spot where we don't really make any difference in the world. But what we're called to is to have this kind of comprehensive thinking that we, can be, that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds and that we can seek the Lord with all of our heart and then that all of our lives can be a fragrant offering to the Lord. This is our goal, to kind of bring this stuff all together. It's funny, there's, um, there's a song that is one of my favorites of all time. How many of you know the song, Just a Little Talk with Jesus? And Just a Little Talk with Jesus makes it right. But here's, here's the problem that I've run into over the years. It's, it's one of my top four or five favorite songs in the whole entire history of the whole entire world, of all the stuff that I've heard. Because when I was a little boy, that was one of the last songs on a record that we had in our house, a record. Now, for you people younger than me, it's, it's a big CD. And for the people, I guess, younger than me, what a CD is, is this... <laughs> A record, a tape, an album. A C we had a record in our house. Actually, this is, this is when I was really little. We had a record player, and, and there were six or eight or ten records that were kind of like the ones that we, that we cycled through a lot. We had a couple of them that were kid albums, and, and then there was a Kenny Rogers, and there was a Statler Brothers, and there was an Oak Ridge Boys, and this is, this is what formed my childhood. But in, uh, in the early 80s, the Statler Brothers had an album called The Originals. And these four men sang a version of Just a Little Talk with Jesus that, as far as I knew, was a new song for them. And when I was a little boy, I heard that song, and, and the, the one fellow, I'm sure my brother could tell you his first name, the one fellow who sang bass and had a really deep voice. I wanted to be that when I grew up. I wanted to sing bass. And I can't. I sing tenor. But they sang a version of Just a Little Talk with Jesus that, that still just really stirs my heart, and, and it ruined me for every other version of that. I hear anybody else, even fantastic musicians and fantastic choirs, they sing just a little talk with Jesus, and it's not right. That's not how you sing that song. That's not how the harmonies should go. That, nope, they sang that, they sang that too slow or they sang it too fast. There's, I have been formed by listening to that record when I was a six-year-old kid. None of us were trying to do that. We just wanted some music in the house. But it affected me, and now I can't hear other versions of that song without getting just a little aggravated because that's not how you do it. Have any of you had... Uh, I'm going to talk to you old people again for just one more moment. Any of you folks ever have like a favorite album and then the band came out with a live version and the live version wasn't just quite right? Maybe it was even better. Maybe it was in a great arena and everybody just went nuts for it. Maybe it was a slightly better arrangement, but it wasn't the way you heard it for that six months that you listened to the original album in your car, right? We get conditioned. You and I, as people, we get conditioned to a really strong sense of how things ought to be, even with little stuff like how you sing that song. But I wonder, church, in all the ways that we've been conditioned, ha have we brought all of that stuff under the banner of Christ? Have we brought all of that stuff under the order of our Lord so that we're not just running around spouting our opinions or living by our preferences, but we are actually living for God? See, this is, I think, what John 6 is starting to point us to. It's interesting. In John 6, at the very beginning, um, this is happening. This stuff that I'm going to summarize for you quickly is happening about one year into Jesus' ministry. Right? So he lived 30 years on earth, and, and was, he was the son of God, and all that, but he, he kind of kept a low profile until the last three years of his life, and, and he did some amazing things. He was baptized, and he did public ministry and miracles and all that kind of stuff. And so in that last three years of his life, we're catching the story 
right as year one is turning into year two. So Jesus has some followers. People are catching on that this guy is really something. Some people believe that he's the son of God. Other people are just blown away by what he can do. But we pick up the story in John 6. It says that Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. A great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. So Jesus heals the sick over and over, different people with all kinds of different ailments, and he heals them, and the congr- or, I'm sorry, the community realizes that healing is happening, so they follow him. Not everybody believes that he's the Lord, but they know that there is something happening that's amazing. In John 6, 5, it says that when Jesus looked up from that far shore of the Sea of Galilee and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, who was one of his closest followers, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And Philip says, oh, Jesus, we could never afford it to too many people. And, and they said, but we found uh, just a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. Go home and read this today at lunchtime or this afternoon as you wait for the ball game. Read John 6 and you can get the whole picture. But Jesus took those loaves. It says in John 6, 11, that he took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with a couple of fish. And what happened is one kid's lunch fed over 5,000 people. This was one more of those miracles of Jesus recorded here in John 6. And it says in John 6, 14, after the people saw that sign, this sign of feeding over 5,000 people with one lunch, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And then in verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing. The waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on water, and they were frightened. So Jesus has done this miracle. Thousands of people came. They eat. They were amazed. Hmm, this guy is really something. Could he be the prophet? That night, the disciples decided to go back across the lake, but Jesus didn't come with them. So they went down, got in the boat, rowed three or four miles. The waves got rough. Jesus walked out to see them. And now we've just quickly summarized two of those miracles that so many of you heard about in Sunday school. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus walked on the water. In the morning, John 6, the very next day, the crowd realized that neither Jesus or his disciples were there where they had been fed yesterday. So they got into the boats, went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus said in John 6, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. In other words, Jesus said, you're looking for me. You're looking for me because your belly's got filled. You're not looking for me because of who I am. You're looking for me because of the way I served you. You're not really seeking me out for what I have to offer you. He gets more clear, John 6, 27, he says, don't work for food that spoils, like that bread and that fish I gave you yesterday, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And so the people ask him, they said, Jesus, Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So there's this back and forth. Jesus is talking about eternal life and and believing in him, and the people don't quite get it because they're just still really fascinated that he fed all of them and, and that maybe he'll feed them again with some bread and some fish. So in their confusion, in John 6, 30, it says that they ask him, well, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So these Jewish folks say, Moses gave our ancestors manna in the wilderness. They're talking about something that happened 1,500 years ago. They said, that was a real sign. Jesus, what are you going to show us? Now, they're asking him about a sign. They're telling him about bread. And literally yesterday, he gave them all the bread and fish that they could eat. These people are almost as dumb as we can be. They ask him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? The indication being that despite all they've seen, they don't believe him yet. What are you going to do, Jesus? How are you going to prove it? Jesus said to them, 
Very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, sir, always give us this bread. They're still thinking about food. They're still thinking about being hungry. They're still thinking about having something to chew on, swallow, and eat. And Jesus is saying, wait, life comes from me. My Father in heaven sent me down to show you life. And if you will believe in me, I will give you eternal life. This is the gospel. It's what he's offering to them. Thousands of people following him back and forth across the lake. And then Jesus declared, what's it say in verse 35? He said, I am the bread of life. And this is where we pick up our sermon scripture this morning, finally at 1130. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now remember, remember the context of what we've seen in the first 34 verses of John 6. Jesus has fed them with bread and fish. Jesus is shifting the conversation from a physical feeding, and he's telling them, I will fulfill all the needs of your heart and of your soul and of your whole life. It's not just a food thing. It's about a life and a heart thing. And so they say, always give us this bread. And this is where he says, I am the bread. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Does that mean that because we believe we're absolutely going to have a great lunch today? Christians, is that what he's saying? No. No, what he's saying is that when people come to him, he will fill and fulfill all that needs to be filled within us. And frankly, I wonder if we trust him enough to feed us every day anyway, because most of us have gotten used to thinking we do it ourselves. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then in verse 36, to this crowd, he says, as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. These people, they're following him because he's been healing folks. They're following him now and asking him because they've seen that he can bring the food and they still don't believe it. How much, how much would you have to see to buy it? Those of you who are believers, those of you who are convinced about the fact that Jesus is the son of God and he is the answer to all of our questions and he is the savior through all of our problems. What have you had to see to believe it? How many of you saw loaves and fishes multiplied? Any of you ever have a miraculous supper? I know some of you have seen some amazing things, but did any of you have that? And yet you've believed. Did any of you see somebody literally healed? I know a few of you have. I know a few of you feel that you have been healed and, and you believe, right? Do you see this crowd? Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen all this and you still don't believe. Can you see the hardness of hearts in these thousands of people? They've tasted, I mean, on their, on their lips are still the crumbs from yesterday's supper. And they're still saying, what are you gonna show us? As they pull out a leftover chunk of bread from their pocket. What are you going to do, Jesus? Prove it to us. Jesus says, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. He says, I am the bread of life. You come to me, and you will be mine. He says, verse 38 of John 6, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, I'm not just working for myself. I'm working for the Lord. He goes on and clarifies John 6, 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Jesus says, I'm not just talking about filling your bellies for today. I'm not even just talking about saving you so that you can have life to the full in this life. I'm talking about in the very last day when the final, final happens, I will raise you up. Jesus says, this is what I can do. I am the bread of life. It says in John 6, 40, my father's will is that everybody who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day and that should be such good news because they're all standing right there. He says, just look at me and believe and you can have eternal life and they can all literally, and I hope you know by now that I use the word literally carefully, they can all look at him because he is speaking to them. It's not us reading about it 2,000 years later. He was standing right there. I mean, right there. He says, just see me and believe. And yesterday, 
Yesterday, before he walked across the lake, yesterday, he gave them bread and fish. This should be such good news because everybody there should be able to say, oh, yeah, cool. I'm in. Jesus, what are you? Right? I mean, what else do you need? He is standing right there. Have you ever prayed for that kind of an experience? that you would be able to be in the midst, in the presence of Jesus right now? Have you ever been in a place like that? I know some of you have. I've heard your stories. You've told your stories up here about how you knew that God was so close to you. You know how that's carrying you through life right now, don't you? These people stood there in front of him. He, he said, just, I'm standing here right now. You've seen what I've done. I'm telling you who I am. Just believe in me, and I will raise you up at the last day. It says in John 6, 41, that at this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Never mind the fact that he gave him lunch yesterday. Stop grumbling among yourselves, he answered. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Jesus doesn't just say, oh, fine, you don't believe. He comes back again. No, guys, I'm telling you, I'm right here. Believe in me and you'll have eternal life. I am the bread of life, John 6, 48. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, but they died. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I'm the living bread. I came down from heaven. And then verse 52, the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? On hearing this, the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? And I just, I wish I could, I wish I could see like a video. I wish somebody had had their phone there right then to capture it. I'd love to see Jesus' face. I, I wonder, what do I have to say? What do I have to do to get through to you? I'm telling you where life is. I gave you the food. I walked over here. You're blown away and you're still bickering and arguing and grumbling. Verse 61, aware that his disciples, that is people who followed him, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Did I make you mad? Are you bothered by this? then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? What if you see me go right back up to heaven? Will that help you? The Spirit gives life. Flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life, yet there are some of you who do not believe. And it says in John 6, 66. Interesting that verse 666 tells us that many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They had the word standing in front of them, delivering them words of truth, delivering them words of promise, delivering them bread and fish, showing them signs and showing them miracles, and yet so many would not believe. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And here's the question that we have to wrestle with today. Here's the question that I wrestle with. I believe in Jesus. I've seen some things that I would consider to be miracles, and I've heard testimonies about so many more. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe that the Bible is true when it speaks about who Jesus is and about all the other stuff that's in there. But is my whole life oriented around this king, or am I still chasing after something else because it's not the way it seems like it ought to be? Am I still, based on my history and the things that I've heard and the things that I've learned and the things that I'm used to, am I, am I still chasing after something that's not going to be true? Am I as blind as these who were standing here? I don't think I am. I hope I'm not. And I pray that God will help me to see the truth. But are you asking yourself these same questions? Are you seeing Jesus for all that he is? Is your whole heart in line with him and seeking after him and hungering for him and thirsting for him? Are you looking for him with all that you are because he is all that you need? Or are you grumbling? Are you scratching your head? Are you saying, boy, this is just too hard? I wonder, I wonder if everything that we do can be fully brought in line with this Jesus 
who is the bread of life, who fills us and sustains us, who gives us everything we need. I wonder if we can be that focused on this one who is that perfect. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to shift gears. I'm going to let that question hang for a bit. I'd like to shift gears as we just take a few minutes to end this sermon time. I'd like to end um, with a time of prayer. We're going to have a closing song after that. Um, and, and Ruben's led us in some valuable prayer today. But um, one of the areas in the last week where I've seen a lot, of, a lot of stuff get complicated is as we pray for events around the world. Uh, we know that there is uh, there's war happening in a lot of different places. Um, but especially, um, especially in Israel, uh, and, and Israel and Palestine and, and that whole area right now. It was, it was really interesting. Um, two pastors who I know really well were actually in Israel on a tour in September. So they got back home less than a month ago. And they talked about how on their trip, they were blessed to be able to spend time in Israel with Israeli Christians. And then they were able to spend time in Palestine at a few of the sites that are kind of the Bible sites but are no longer within the boundaries of, of the Israel that was created in 1948. And so they were, they were at a couple of sites that were in Palestine, and so they got to know some Palestinian Christians as well. And so as I reflected with those friends this week, their prayer just went out for all of the believers, regardless of which side and which nation and which politics. Their prayers went out for all of the believers who find themselves in the line of fire this week. And I wonder, we spent some time last week praying that, that there would be peace and that lives would be saved. But I wonder if we can close our time today and, and just acknowledge we have, all of us in this room, we have a lot of baggage about Israel stuff based on how we were raised or, or how, how our preachers when we were young thought about Israel or taught or preached about Israel. And there is a, so much complicated stuff with all the politics. But I wonder if we can take a moment and pray for all of the people and especially the believers in Israel and Palestine who find themselves in a war zone right now. Because I think our prayers matter. And I think this is just one of those big things that a lot of people are talking about. So I'd, I'd like to pray. And so I'm going to give you a moment just to pray quietly where you are for whatever it is that the Spirit leads you to pray about. But then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to close our time with a spoken prayer, and then we're going to, we're going to sing a final song um, that, that kind of calls us back to this time of worship, and we're going to sing to our King. But can we take a moment uh, to pray? And again, pray as you feel led, but I would encourage you to pray, especially for those, those believers of every nationality. Jesus says, all who come to me and believe will be saved. So would you pray for all those believers right now, church? O oh Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, we come to you and admit that, that there are pieces of us that are unformed, that have not yet been brought into full alignment with your spirit because we, just, we haven't realized or we haven't been willing to yield ourselves. There are parts of us that still grumble and complain and say it's too hard when we're confronted with your word. There are parts of us that still don't quite understand what it means for Jesus to be the bread of life. And Lord, there, there are places in our lives today that just seem difficult to, uh, to reconcile to the truth that we see in your scripture. Lord, there are things that frustrate us. There are things that don't seem right. Evil is in our midst and evil is running amok. 
And there is great violence. And there is death. And there is disease. And Lord, we don't like any of it. God, our hearts go out, especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those who are hurting. Those who are grieving. Those who are compromised and in great danger. Lord, would you please give them strength for today? Strength that allows them to wear their faith on their sleeve, that allows them to think about their ultimate hope. Lord, would you be bread to them today? And Lord, for us here, as we think about, as we think about all the stuff, as we think about our faith and our beliefs and our politics and our actions, as we think about how we spend our time, how we volunteer, how we give, Lord, would you please work in our hearts and bring it all back to you. Help us not to be like these folks in John 6 who just didn't get it. Help us not to be like these folks who just argued about the little details and missed the big point. Help us, Lord, not to be the kind of disciples that turn back and no longer follow. But Lord, help us to be faithful. Be bread to us. Be bread for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing much difficult circumstances than what we're facing right now. Now, Lord, finally, we pray for those of us in this room who are struggling right now. Be strength here, too. And help us, no matter what's going on, to continue to sing, Greater You, Lord, to give you praise, to give you honor, because you're our hope. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Church, in the midst of all this, can we... uh, Can we sing to our king? We have a closing song today. Sing to the king.
So whether you understand it all or not, keep singing to the king. Whether it all makes sense or not, continue to shout, great are you, Lord. And as you move forward, just go be the church. Let the Spirit lead you and let the Spirit guide you as you continue to tell, to tell people what Jesus told us, that he is life. He is the way and truth. He is the bread that we need and he is our hope. So go from this place now and be the church. As you go, just a little detail. We have a help hunger walk happening here this afternoon. People are gonna start rolling in in about 10 minutes from our community as they're gonna be walking around our outside of our building and, our, and around the neighborhood raising money um, for those who are hungry. A lot of you, as you leave this place, you're not used to seeing other cars coming in the driveway. So just heads up for that, okay? He heads up as the, as the traffic is coming and going both ways. Uh, but blessings to you. Go now and be the church and see how God leads you to do that. Amen?